Scene 78, take one. 78, wow, that's a lot of hot air. My name is Paul Greenstein. Originally born in New Jersey, moved to California in July of 1961. Probably the first time I came to downtown Los Angeles would have been August 61. We actually lived in Baldwin Hills, and we would either drive to Bunker Hill and then take Angel's Flight down and do shopping, or we'd take a bus and take a streetcar, because there still were a couple of streetcar lines, and we'd do our shopping downtown. So I remember going to the Bradbury building in probably about 1961 or 62, Fast forward many years later, about 1969, I collected old clothing, old uniforms. I had some friends that were older friends. Every Saturday, they'd pick me up at about 8.30 or 9 a.m. I had to sneak out because my parents hated them. And we'd go downtown and we'd cruise this area for rag warehouses. Summer, fall of 76. There was a place called the Atomic Cafe, best noodle in town. They were open from 3 in the afternoon till 3 in the morning. And I said, okay, I'm going to give that place a try. It's got to be funny. One of the first times I went, they gave me something to eat, and it was pretty bad. But I thought the place was kind of charming. I didn't mind bad food if the place was good. And there was this huge rumbling sound. Like, the whole place sounded like it was just going to shake itself apart. And I thought, okay, nobody's actually paying attention. I guess it's nothing bad. And this guy walks in, and he gets a cup of coffee from the waitress. And he drinks it, and he says hello, and he walks back out. Gets in the train that's parked in the middle of Alameda and drives off. And I thought, that's great. So it became one of my favorite places. Soon after that, Nancy, who was running the place with her husband, Kiyoshi, came to me and said, well, you know, we're going to go out of business. The landlord just raised our rent 300% and we don't make enough money here to do it. And I said, well, I'll start doing advertisements for you. It's probably 77 and the whole punk rock thing was coming and the place just took off. There's literally people fighting to get in there. We never really put on any events at the Atomic. There'd be a show downtown. And you go, okay, well, everyone's going to come here afterwards. Let's get ready. That was all. All the local punk rock guys were there. The one who I remember the most was Tomato Duplenty. Back then, he was a big star, and so the person who was probably most influential in getting people to go there was him, because he went there a lot. The people who are here that work at the Atomic Cafe are ready to go back to Tokyo any day of the week. They never have jet lag. Kyoshi had been a film student at USC. While he was going to school, he worked at the Atomic, which used to be down the block. He went back to Japan, and he was a fairly well-known, fairly respected television director. He did something bad. He screwed up somehow. So what he did is he came back to the US, lived in one of those flop house hotels that used to be around, and got his job back at the Atomic. Married Nancy, and got the restaurant. At the time, I didn't know he was a junkie because I never saw him nod out. I had a different relationship with him. Nancy would call me and say, hey, there's a show, and we're expecting all these people. Can you come by? And I'd come by, and I was kind of like the ringmaster a little bit. I put records in the jukebox, you know, the famous jukebox at the Atomic. And all seemed good up until Nancy couldn't handle the success and just became kind of a mess. And one day I walked in there, and nobody would talk to me. So I never went there again. The Atomic led to Madame Wong's, what happened there. I was working at Art Center. I had a friend that was a photographer. We were out taking pictures in Los Angeles, and we went to Chinatown. And it was dark, and it was late, and there was nobody there. But you could hear all this music and laughter and kind of wild times coming from somewhere. So we kind of followed it, and there was a club upstairs. And we thought, wow, let's go see what's happening. So we walked up the steps, and nobody in there. It was a recording. So I wound up talking to the bartender, whose name was George. He and his wife, Esther, owned the place. I was working at a place that restored old jukeboxes, and it was down off of Alameda. So I'd go upstairs, I'd have lunch and a beer and talk to George. And one day I looked and I went, you know, these guys got a stage, and they don't ever use it. So I thought, what a great place for a club. So I asked George, and he called me back three or four days later, and he says, well, I'll talk to my wife. My wife says no. And I kept bugging him and bugging him and bugging him. And so she says, okay. We'll give it a try. And you've got three months, and if it doesn't work, you're out the door. So I did it. I did the sound. I did the bookings. I did the advertising. I did everything but run the bar. I would go to Rodney on the Rock, and he'd interview me on the air every week. Say, like, yeah, well, what's going on at Madame Wong's, you know? I liked punk rock a lot, but I also liked cowboy music, and I liked swing music, and I liked early jazz. I booked a lot of different things. I did a rockabilly night, stuff I liked. 
like X. The world doesn't fall and you know, rise on my tastes, but for a little while it did. In Rolling Stone, they're interviewing Pete Townsend, and they're saying, well, what do you think's going on that's exciting? He goes, well, you know, there's a club in Los Angeles that's in a Chinese restaurant. That sounds great. And I went, really? Because here it is, you know, a guy that I really thought was great saying that something I was doing was great. So it actually got, like, worldwide renowned. But Esther was a difficult person, as everybody knows. She called me up at 3 in the morning. She go, oh, you know, Paul, you're such a nice boy, and all the things you've done, it's really, really good, and I really like it. And the next morning, she called me up at 4 in the morning and go, And I thought, I don't need this. I'm not making any money. The most money I ever made on a show was $60. I was giving it all to the bands. That's why the bands like playing there, because they got paid well. In the 78, there was a band called 2020. They were kind of a pop band. And they called me up and they say, we would like to do a residency every Wednesday at Madame Wong's. And I went, oh, I don't do residencies right now. I want it to be eclectic. They said, okay, fine, dot, 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 we'll show him. So what they did was they went to Madame Wong directly and they said, well, you know, this guy, Paul, he's a jerk. You're having trouble because of the punk rock bands he books. I had a, a small riot when the bags played and somebody broke a cigarette machine. And Esther Wong said, oh, you know, girls in bands, bad, makes the boys crazy, it's bad. No more girls in bands. So every week it would be like new rules. No more people with more than three vowels in their name. And then one day I walked in there and there's Esther talking to the manager of 2020 and this woman. And this woman was the new booking agent at Madame Wong's. And I went, that time's up. And I just walked out and never went back. When you have a place like that, you make a lot of friends real quick. And one of them was Mark Kreisel. And he was living downtown on Los Angeles Street. And Mark came to me and he says, I'd like to get into the club scene. You know, we need some kind of underground club here. And you and I will go into business, you'll run it for me, and I'll put up the money. And I thought, you know, that's perfect. So I didn't have any money. So we started looking at all these places that he had, and to me, one was worse than the next. Basically, it was like abandoned buildings that he could get for free. I remember one we looked at, we had to like bust open some boarded stuff, and, and it was just like a little hovel full of crap and piss and shit. And it was on uh, Fifth and Wall. At a time when Fifth and Wall was not just bad, but really bad. So we went and looked at that condemned building, we went and looked at the Hard Rock, we went and looked at this place, we went and looked at that place, and finally we went to Al's Bar relatively early in 79. And out of all the places we looked at, it's the only one I said, you know, this is something you could make a club out of. It's big enough, there's enough stuff here, it's interesting enough, this is the only one out of all these things you've shown me that'll happen. We were in his loft one time, and Mark says, you like boxing? And I said, not really. And he goes, you ever box? And I said, no. He goes, you ever want to box? And I went, no. And he goes, let's try boxing. I'm six one and a half. I'm not a huge guy, but I'm big enough. Mark's five seven, and he gets these gloves, and he's like basically forcing the gloves on my hand, and he's putting gloves on too, and he starts punk, taking shots at me, punk, and I started laughing because it was just so ridiculous. I couldn't help myself. I was like giggling, and the more I giggled, the angrier he got, and he's trying to hit me harder, and then finally I just took off the gloves and I said, stop. And he's like, what do you mean stop? Come on, man. And, like, and I'm thinking, do I want to be in a business with this guy? No. And six, eight, however many months later, all of a sudden there was Al's Bar. And it was a club. And I kind of went, oh well. I'm not going to be in the film. I don't care what you say, what you do. I'm not going to be in the film. Don't point that camera at me, I'm telling you. Keep that fucking camera away from me. Nobody can represent you except you. So when people ask me to do stuff like this, I mean, you know, I just went through this thing with the Atomic where they basically wrote me out of their history. The only recourse I have is to do stuff like this. If Chrysler wants his story told, he should be sitting here telling his story. Whether it's true or false or what he thinks or the gospel, he's got to sit here and tell it. Blackie's was over on La Brea and Melrose, and it was an after-hours club that I started. Blackie's had been a gay strip club on La Brea that wasn't making any money anymore. That's why it was called Blackie's, because it was painted black inside and I didn't have the money to paint over the black. It was a really cool place, but the people that I got involved in were also kind of reprehensible.
I moved to Silver Lake in September of 76. There was always this little cafe over on Sunset Boulevard that was pretty much always closed because they were open at six and they closed at noon. So I always missed them. And kind of like the Atomic, I went, well, okay, I got to find out what this place is about. And I went there and it was a little eight stool diner run by Millie and Jack. And the food was awful, but like the Atomic, it was a very charming place and I liked it. And I went there for years and years and years. And now it was 1984 and I went in there and they said, have a cup of coffee on us because we're going out of business. So we bought Millie's. So Millie's became institution. <laughs> It's still there. I worked at Trump's, if you know Trump's in West Hollywood, kind of California Nouvelle Cuisine place. And I worked there as an assistant pastry chef. And the most recent thing I did was the Blue Star down on 15th and Santa Fe. I worked there for five years doing breakfast on Saturday mornings for free. Again, what do I ever learn? Will I ever learn? Do I ever learn? No. I played bagpipes. I played bagpipes for a long time. And you can't practice bagpipes at home, period. Because I don't care where you live, nobody's going to like it. In the 70s, in the mid-70s, I used to come down on 4th and the 6th Street tunnel down to the river at night and play the bagpipes for two, three hours. And nobody ever bothered me, ever, because there was nobody. No one ever said, hey, can you keep it down a little bit? Or at least learn to play better? Like, no. That's what it was like here then. Nothing. There was a building for sale, $120,000, 7th Santa Fe. My friend Marilyn and I, who were looking for a place together, we were going to buy it. Nobody would give us a loan. So it just kind of tumbled into nothing and I got into other things. What I was doing at the time was I really liked Little Tokyo and I really liked the history of the area. And there used to be Mitsuru toys with the big monster out in front. I would fix all their toys. They would get these giant shipments of toys from Japan and maybe 20% of them would be broken, like mechanical robots. And I'd just take them all home and I'd take them all apart and I'd put them all back together and I'd fix 90% of them and they'd sell them. This area was all warehouses. 70% of those warehouses were gone. This was dead zone. In the 70s, we thought that we were establishing something that would last and we kind of didn't because it kind of went up and then nosedive and then it picked up again and now it's just going up, 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 up. Well, I'd rather see it go up than go away. I saw enough stuff go away. I don't feel like I'm a part of it anymore, but I'm glad that it's here and I'm glad that we can sit in this building and talk about this stuff now as opposed to parking lot. Okay.